Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. I'm so excited about tonight's show. It's 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 part of the juicy material that I just love to get into all the time. I have Joseph Philby with me tonight, and we're going to be talking about um, one of his books, The Yugas, Keys to Understanding Our Hidden Past, Emerging Present, and Future. A bit about the book. With far-reaching changes happening on virtually a daily basis, Many are wondering if we are due for a world-changing global shift and what the future holds for mankind. Praman Hansna, Hansna, I I, I am going to mispronounce this all over the place, Yogananda, I got, the author of the classic autobiography of yoga and his teacher, Sri Yukteswar, offered key insights into this subject nearly a century ago. They presented a fascinating explanation of the rising and falling eras that our planet cycles through every 24,000 years. According to their teachings, we have recently passed through the low ebb in the cycle and are moving forward to a higher age, an energy age that will revolutionize the world. They declared that we would live in a time of great social and spiritual change and that much of what we believe to be fixed and true our entire way of looking at the world would ultimately be transformed and uplifted. In the yugas, Joseph Selby and David Steinmetz present substantial and intriguing evidence from the findings of historians and scientists that demonstrate the truth of Yukteswar and Yogananda's revelations. Joseph enjoys making the complex and obscure simple and clear. He's the author of two books that we've had him on talking about, Break Through the Limits of the Brain with How Neuroscience Supports Spiritual Experience and the Physics of God, A Unification of Science and Religion. And now The Yugas, a factual book, a factual, sorry, look at India's tradition of cylindrical history. He's known for creating bridges of understanding between the modern experience-based discoveries of science and the timeless experience-based discoveries of the mystics. That's a cool, cool bridge he's got there. A dedicated, a dedicated Kriya Yoga meditator for nearly 50 years, he's taught yoga, meditation, and universal experiential spirituality throughout the U.S. and Europe. This this book is absolutely one of those things that, that I encourage everybody to pick up and read because you suddenly see a pattern. You suddenly are seeing how you can relate to what the yogis were talking about, and it's, it's happening absolutely in our faces. And if you look at the, the system of the yugas and how – we flow between them and and we go up and we go down, it makes perfect sense. And it gives you a better idea as to the cycles of history and and the evolution of our our planet and obviously our our species as well. So welcome to the show, 
Joseph, now that I've screwed up all the names here, um, <laughs> you can say them right. Yogananda, I knew, you know, that, that, that one I could do with, but um, it's almost like they have a whole new, well, it is a new language. It's a different language. And I would imagine, as you said earlier, um, if an Indian person or one of Indian background said the names it would probably sound oh, it would definitely sound a lot more different than me but um, somehow my tongue just doesn't twist the right way so I beg well, forgiveness well you're not uh, you're not alone but Yogananda well, it, will do and the other Yukteswar is a little harder but uh, you got it right oh wow well that was an accident I'm sure um my t- it's it's these wonderful swamis and and their studies and the records that were kept um what what fascinates me is with all of the records that they've kept throughout time that they have access to they can not only look to the future but look to the past as well with great um um meticulous accuracy which is which which is so profound, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it is amazing. There are a lot of ancient sciences lost in the uh, the mists of time that are now considered, and, and as you were referring to astrology, now considered to be, uh, you know, either meaningless or uh, inaccurate or just too broad to be of any use, but in fact, they were practiced at one time in the past at such a high level uh, that individual horoscopes had been cast for people yet to be born. Oh, and wow. that in, uh, in India today, you can go to uh, what are called Brigu Pundits, Brigu, uh, that are have a, a typically they're a a family lineage that the the latest person in the family who is the pundit was the son of a man who was the pundit and so on back generations and generations so far in the past that they can't even really keep track of how many generations and if you go to one of these brigu pundits They will ask you a few questions, particularly about your birth, time, and place. And they can go dig out of their uh, their kind of storerooms an entire horoscope, or at least the key parts of a horoscope, written on a palm leaf often, and they will describe your life to you and be accurate, a good friend, went and had this experience and he was told that uh, he had a sister and he didn't and he was a little bit taken aback but he uh, talked to his mother about it after he returned from India and she said well you you did have a sister but she died uh, before she could be born and oh wow so amazing insights into a person's life and these horoscopes were cast you know perhaps thousands of years before the people who are actually hearing them were even alive so astrology suggests and that ability of astrology like i'm describing suggests a science a very very high attainment not the kind of um you know, parlor trick, I think, that many people think it is today. Yeah, I, I you know, when, when you get computers going with it and you take the human element out of it, um, I would say that, that most probably part of the, the uh, I'll use the term magic, um, that is involved in it has a great deal to do not only with the accuracy of the planets and, and everything that goes around them, but also the level of consciousness of the person that's doing the casting. Yes, and I think that uh, you know, you go right to the heart of 
what makes the cycle of the yuga so interesting to me and many others like yourself is that the yugas as a system suggest that not only were there high attainments in the past, uh, high levels of civilization in the past, but that the consciousness of mankind was higher in the past, that they had a more refined uh, spirituality uh, 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, compared to today, which is a relatively uh, low state in terms of what can actually be attained. So that, if you look back to the past, as I was fascinated enough to do and research and write this book, what I was looking for in the past was not just uh, fascinating attainments like the Great Pyramid, but evidence of higher awareness, higher consciousness. And uh, the Book of Brigu and uh, the astrological uh, potential that it expresses is just one of, of many things. And then, of course, with the cycle, with the yugas, we're mm-hmm. talking about this us moving into those higher ages again, that we've, uh, the cycle as it was presented by Sri Yukteswar is 24,000 years in duration. And that about roughly 2,000 years ago, uh, we, no, that's too long, uh, a roughly, I'll get this right. Yeah, about 2,000 years ago, we passed through the the nadir of the cycle, the low point. And if you look at history, during that time, what you have is the the end of the Greek Empire, the the strength of the Roman Empire. the Egyptian Empire was almost completely defunct by then. So around 500 A.D., when Rome was sacked and destroyed by the, the Visigoths, this was considered by Sri Teshwar to be the low point of the cycle, that this was the nadir, this is when the consciousness of mankind was at its lowest. And there's... A lot of reason to think that is true. If you look not just at the Romans, but around the world, you will see that any of the civilizations that were still functioning at that time were brutal places. The whole notion of human rights didn't even exist as a as a concept, as as horrifying as it is to our modern sensibilities when Tiberius Caesar was at his peak not too far from that 500 AD nadir and the Colosseum had been built and the the games were played to keep the Roman populace entertained in a single day 10,000 people were killed while a crowd watched it and cheered it on. Wow. It was unthinkable to us today. But that was that was the the low point of human consciousness really. Is, uh, is that in, the same time is that the same time period when uh the Library of Alexandria and the Chinese um emperor had all the books burned? Very close. And in fact it it preceded that low point by anywhere from two to 500 years, that almost all of the great libraries of the ancient world were destroyed. So we're probably most of us, having been educated in the West, are familiar with the Library of Alexandria having been burned. But uh, as you mentioned, the Emperor Qin had everything about 2nd century uh, A.D. completely 
uh, destroyed. He didn't want there to be any evidence of anything greater than himself left for people to learn about. And similarly, other uh, repositories of, of ancient knowledge were destroyed. It was almost as if the entire uh, world civilization was was going into a, a, a deliberate and determined amnesia about the past and then came into our time without any of that uh, ancient knowledge uh, intact. Mm-hmm. What we what we really have is archaeology and the, the uh, relatively few written uh, material that allows us to piece together the past as we, as we know it. But there was a lot more information in those ancient is, times. And go ahead. Is, is that is that time frame around when? Um, the, the the texts were put in into the Dead Sea Scrolls and put into the jars and hidden in caves, or was that a later time? That's pretty close to that time. Yes, um, the you know the the hoarding of knowledge and hiding of knowledge it is very um, widespread during that period. The, the, the lowest of the ages. It perhaps would help your listeners if I described that not only is there this 24,000-year cycle, within that cycle there are what are known as the ages. And yugas literally means ages. So the yugas is a collection of ages. And uh, uh, each age has its own name. So the lowest age in the yuga cycle is Kali Yuga and from uh, 700 BC to 500 AD was the lowest swing of Kali Yuga and then from 500 AD up to 1700 AD was the upswing of Kali Yuga but the two together, 2,400 years, that's the nadir. But we now have moved out of the lowest age, according to Sri Yukteswar, and have entered what's called Dwapara Yuga. And Dwapara Yuga literally just means the second yuga. Dwapara means two. Uh, and the second yuga, as we go forward into time, lasts for another uh, 2,000, 2,100 years from now, and then we'll go into another age called Treta Yuga, and uh, this one means three. So it's the third age, the third Yuga, and that lasts for 3,600 years, and then we'll go into the highest of all ages, the Satya Yuga, and that lasts 4,800 years. And then when we reach the peak, the cycle will begin to decline again. So going, looking into the future, when Satya Yuga has reached its peak, there'll be a downward swing of Satya Yuga and then a downward swing of Treta Yuga and a downward swing of Dwapara Yuga back into Kali Yuga. And that this happens uh, in this 24,000-year time span. So what I was fascinated to see... I uh, majored for a while, before I switched my major, in Greek studies, Greek history, Greek philosophy, and then I switched to uh, Indian history and Indian philosophy. And so I was fairly well grounded in the sort of mainstream picture of the ancient past. But there are a lot of anomalies in that picture that, uh, are admitted to by many scholars of, of ancient history, prehistory, that just seem to stand out as being inexplicable for what was considered to be the awareness, the abilities 
of mankind at those times. And as I mentioned uh, as we got started, the Great Pyramid is one of my favorite examples of something that is just inexplicable. It's been around for so long that its uh, its very familiarity sort of makes people miss how extraordinary it is and still is, even uh, coming up on 5,000 years after it was built. But the mainstream archaeology, which is um, Darwinian, so the, the main view of the way history unfolds is that mankind in the 5,000, 6,000 B.C. kind of zone began to uh, leave its hunter-gatherer roots behind, uh, still very much in the Stone Age, still very primitive. Languages were, uh, you know, almost non-existent. And then around 3,000 B.C., uh, all over the world, which is an interesting thing, all over the world, cities began to spring up, and they became uh, trading hubs, and they became uh, stratified. So you had people for the first time being merchants and being soldiers and being uh, laborers, and that this pattern emerged around 3000 BC and continued on into the Roman period and on into our day. And so that view of things, that's the mainstream Darwinian view that civilization was evolving, if you will, right alongside man evolving and mm -hmm. man becoming more intelligent and, you know, coming out of the Stone Age into what we now think of as our modern age and the pinnacle of the development of civilization. But if you look at that arc of development, if you look at that straight line, excuse me, of development, you have the Great Pyramid sitting there at 3000 B.C., or roughly mm -hmm. 3000 B.C. Uh, today's mainstream archaeology says that the Great Pyramid was a tomb, that it was built no. to house the remains of one pharaoh, Cheops, and that it had been, like later discoveries in the, the Valley of the Kings, it had been filled with treasures and uh, everything that the pharaoh needed to live on in the afterlife in the, in the style to which he had become accustomed. But there's almost no evidence in fact, I would say there really is no evidence that yeah. the Great Pyramid was ever used as a tomb. And moreover, it's enormous. It is this staggeringly large structure, and it's not alone. There are other pyramids built within two or three hundred years of it, to either side of it, that are also astonishingly large. The Great Pyramid, the base of the Great Pyramid covers 13 and a half acres. Each side of the pyramid is a couple thousand feet in length. And yet, the levels of the various blocks, you know, that were assembled to make the Great Pyramid the actual level, if you were on one corner and went to the other corner, they vary from being perfectly level after a couple thousand feet. They vary from being perfectly level by at most five-eighths of an inch. If for no other reason that the Great Pyramid stands out for the accuracy of its construction, uh, what we see in pictures of the Great Pyramid today uh, looks like a, a series of stair steps 
But when it was completed back closer to 3000 BC, each of those stair steps had been filled in by a uh, triangular block of white limestone. And the joins between those blocks of white limestone were almost invisible. There's only a few blocks left, relatively speaking, uh, on the Great Pyramid to show how well the joining was done. But you still, to this day, you can't stick a piece of paper between the joints of this white limestone. So imagine this uh, structure over a 1,000 feet high completely covered by white limestone that was polished and it would gleam in the sun and be seen for miles and miles and miles out into the desert and built to this exacting specification. Then if you go inside the Great Pyramid, you have all these uh, chambers that are also constructed to incredibly fine degrees of accuracy. There are passages in the going down to the lower chamber, which is sort of below the pyramid. There are stretches of that uh, passage that the wall doesn't deviate more than a few thousandths of an inch from being perfectly straight. In another pyramid, uh, which I think is the step pyramid. I may have that wrong. But in another pyramid, there are these gigantic granite chambers. They're, they're called sarcophagi, but, but really you would have had to have been a, a, an oddly shaped giant to need it as your sarcophagus. <laughs> but inside of those... Uh, little chambers, and they all have lids. The uh, walls are so smooth and so exactingly uh, dressed that if you put a, uh, like a square, you know, a carpenter's square, which is perfectly flat or darn near perfectly flat mm -hmm. on one edge, if you put it up against the side of the chamber, and you shine a light from behind it towards yourself, no light. You will see no light between the square and the granite. Wow. None of these things are even remotely possible with what mainstream archaeology believes were the tools available and the knowledge available at the time. So... There are other things going back into the past that are more anomalies, you know, other things that stand out explicably from the picture of the ancient past that our current uh, mainstream prehistory and archaeology uh, suggests they would have had to have been. Another one of my favorites. Now, this is sort of a, a, a soft artifact, if you will. The pyramid is obviously a hard artifact, but a soft artifact from the past is the language of Sanskrit. And you and I were both having fun mispronouncing uh, <laughs> Yogananda's name and Sri Deshwar's names, and those are Sanskrit. But that language originated perhaps as long ago as 6,000, 7,000 B.C. And it is today still the most perfectly accurate language on the planet. Its rules of grammar and syntax are studied by computer programmers wanting to, you know, either create a new programming language or improve a, a, a programming language. And they study it because in 
Sanskrit's exactitude, there's almost no ambiguity. You don't want to have ambiguity in a computer language. The, the computer doesn't know what to do with it. It wants it to be either or, this or that, uh -huh. and to be precisely describable as this or that. And so today you have Sanskrit studied for its exactness, and yet it is perhaps the oldest soft artifact that we have on Earth. Uh, the reason why they think it may have originated as early as six or 7,000 uh, B.C. is because the Vedas, which are written in Sanskrit, have uh, descriptions of astronomical events that are very finely described, very meticulously described. And if a astronomer kind of dials the clock backwards, if you will, of what how long ago it would have been for all of those planets and all of those um, subsections of the uh, the background of space, the, the stations of the moon. If you dialed it all the way back to what is described in the Vedas, you get these dates of six and seven thousand BC. This is known as uh, archaeoastronomy. Mm -hmm. So you have realistic, meticulously recorded astronomical events that probably happened six or 7,000 years ago in a language that uh, is likely to have, have existed from that time to the present. And it is still the most exact language on the planet. Wow. So how, how does that happen? Uh, what the Yuga say is happening is that the intelligence that was required to create such a language, and this is another interesting thing about Sanskrit, is that there does not appear to be any uh, proto-Sanskrit. There does not appear to be any languages that evolved into Sanskrit, but rather Sanskrit was born fully formed, and it was born in order to uh, basically use spoken word to describe deep truths coming from the highest of the ages, such a yuga, the spiritual age, and then just there, uh, six or 7,000 B.C. is the cusp between the last descending Satya Yuga, the last descending spiritual age, and going into the last descending Treta Yuga. Now, Treta Yuga was still a very high age in comparison to our age today, according to the to the Yugas. And this tends to confirm that, that you have a, uh, a scripture written in Sanskrit, uh, and, and it's, it's argued by the the Sanskrit scholars in India that Sanskrit was born in order to write down these uh, or to or to speak the truths that became what are known as the Vedas uh, and to ensure another fascinating thing you can you can stop me any time if I go on too much but another fascinating no, no, thing I... about the the yugas is that I mean about the about Sanskrit is that there is a system that was put into place to ensure that when it was originally passed down orally only, it probably wasn't put into written script until around 3000 BC, 2000 BC. Those are the earliest kind of records they have of it being actually written down, but it has. It again to this day an oral tradition that kept it accurate and it was it had this kind of 
interlocking, self-correcting way that it was chanted in 10 different ways to ensure that any mistakes would get corrected because it had to fit into this interlocking way in which it was uh, it was chanted. So did did the again, people in that did did the people in in the highest level were they aware that there was going to be the decline? I mean, it, it's I mean you put it together and it's it, it's obvious that the level of consciousness of humanity got better and better and better and better and better. Um, the brain size didn't change much, but but when you get to the top, to the peak, were they aware that they were going to that, that this was the beginning of a decline? I mean, why um, didn't they? Keep, I think keep so. Going yes, up? I think they were aware of it. Um, you know, as you and I discussed earlier today, there's there's this. Uh, question that jumps out in a lot of people's mind is why does it go down again why does mankind not just keep going up and up or at least remember some of that development so the rest the next time the cycle comes around we're a little we're a little more advanced than we were the last time we went through the cycle yeah but i think it's long enough in duration 24,000 years is a long time that uh, the decline is very gradual, as is the, uh, the improvement. Point. You know, I have a lot of people who will say to me after I tell them about the yugas, a lot of people say to me, well, doesn't seem like things are getting better today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're, we're surrounded by... Uh, you know, we've got a war in Ukraine, we've got aggressors and usurpers, and we've got terrible things being done to people. And, you know, it, it's easy to think that we are going the opposite direction, that, that we are not yeah. in an upward swing of development. We're in, a, we're in a descent. But that's because it happens too slow for it to be that obvious. If you look back to the turn of the 20th century and you think about what were the norms of our society and what do you find? You find that you had an entire enslaved race living in America and it was legal to just simply shoot them or hang them. No yeah. consequence. You had, uh, you know, half of the population of the United States in women who couldn't vote and who had very little voice. And up until various times in the 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s, various state laws considered them to be uh, chattel, considered them to be things, that anything that was in a family was owned by the husband, including the wife. Yeah. This was a hundred years ago. Yeah. So if you think about how different our society is today and how much better it is on some of these uh, themes, you can begin to appreciate that, in fact, it, things are getting better. They're not good. <laughs> they're not necessarily <laughs> as good as we would like them to be, but they're better. Uh, another odd fact, which, you know, you have to kind of scratch your head a little bit to see how this is good news, but fewer and fewer people die in wars today than they did 100 years ago. So even warfare is being waged in oddly uh, a, a more overall humane way than it was <laughs> You know, the, the Civil War, they were just shooting each other and stabbing each other and slipping yeah. in blood. Uh, you know, it was what we would think of as, as barbaric. But it's very difficult to see it clearly because a 100 years removed from it is like two generations of people. 
And Mm -hmm. unless you, you know, make an effort to really study the past, you may not be aware of how different it is from today. So I think that's also true of the past. That's where your question started, which is, did they know that they were uh, descending? And I think the higher up in the age they were, the more aware they were that they that that civilization as a whole, mankind as a whole, was heading towards being spiritually asleep again. But it was so slow that it didn't necessarily impact the people in any given lifetime. Well, do you think in a way that once we get to that peak that some would try to leave a message for as we went downhill and then started up again to you know i i keep i keep thinking that if 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 i were aware of my place in this this whole scenario if i were say say we were at the very very top and we were aware that this process because you have the 24,000 very close to the 25,000 of the procession of the equinoxes. So, you know, these kind of, of um, sequences and, and journeys, if you will, we, we know they take place. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that, that when you get to the top of the, of the pyramid, so to speak, that there would be an inclination to try to leave a message for the generations that come after us? Well, I think there have been in a way, um, but because today it's largely not believed that there could have been higher ages in the past, what actually was left as messages to us are considered to be um, myths. I prefer the term lore, but mm-hmm. if you look at the um, ancient cultures of the past, including the Chinese, Indian, uh, Greek, uh, North American, uh, Sioux, uh, Norwegian, and there are a couple others that are not springing right into mind. All of these ancient cultures have a story, have a myth, have lore about the fact that there were higher ages in the past. And the one that we're most familiar with in the West, more so than typically the Yugas are for people, are the Greek ages. So you have the Greek concept of there having been a golden age and then a silver age and then a Bronze Mm -hmm. Age, and finally an Iron Age. And you will see some of the traditions, some of the ancient traditions have more than four ages, but many of them have four. And the thing that kind of gives credibility to there having been a truth to it all is that they all say it was higher in the past, and that the age in which that uh, lore was being sort of uh, solidified was lower than before. So there's one indication that this was simply known, that they didn't need to leave some other record. It was passed down from generation to generation that we are going steadily towards an Iron Age or a Kali Yuga Um, There are some fascinating other indicators that suggest the higher civilizations in the past were wanting to leave uh, important information that would endure through time, would endure through uh, being misunderstood. And one of those is the uh, notion of paradise. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned all of the different examples 
of the uh, you know golden age to iron age progression that exists in many ancient traditional cultures across the world a a study was done um, and was published in a book called Hamlet's Mill that indicated that is the second most common myth found around the world. But the first, <coughs> excuse me, the first most common myth is the myth of paradise. And the myth of paradise has in it some commonalities. One that stands out is that in every story, there is the tree in the midst of the garden, or the axis mundi, as it is in um, the, the Sumerian myths. Mm-hmm. And what Sri Keshwar explained about that myth is that there, it's not a story about a place, it's a story about human experience and that this is the highest teaching that comes down from the ancient past, which is that the tree of life is the spine. The axis mundi is the spine. And that when we're centered in the spine, when we're interiorized and feeling ourselves deep in an inner reality that is centered in our spine, then we're in paradise. So it's a it's a teaching about how to achieve paradise, not so much just a description of these oases of paradise or in various places in the world, because every mm-hmm. culture has that myth. It is the most common myth of all the ancient myths that are told. So you have you have the teachings coming down. You have Sanskrit coming down. Uh, there's another fascinating indicator of the ancients wanting to uh, uh, communicate something, which is the Sphinx. Now, the Sphinx, according to uh, current archaeology, was built only slightly before the Great Pyramids, that it might be a little bit older, might be about the same age, but um, in that time frame, so somewhere around 3000 B.C. or earlier. But a study of it was done by several what are kind of alternative archaeologists, uh, found that the weathering of the Great uh, Sphinx is too deep, that there's too much weathering for it to have been built at the same time. And if you go and have a chance to look at it, you can see for yourself that um, it looks like it's been rained on. It looks like it's been mm-hmm. rained on a lot for, you know, hundreds of years. And yet, that part of the world at the time when the pyramids were built was one of the driest areas in the world. And the pyramids themselves don't have that kind of weathering. So how can that be? And it's it's been posited by uh, people like Robert Schock that it was probably built before the sort of rainy period that lasted several thousand years prior to when the Egyptian civilization as we know it that built the pyramids emerged and that it could be as old as 10,000 B.C. rather than 3,000 Mm -hmm. B.C. just based on the weathering patterns. So put that together with another intriguing insight that was um, put forward and I'm I wish I could remember the man's name because he deserves mention, but it's not coming to me. He 
came up with the thought that the Sphinx, with the body of a lion and the head of the pharaoh, is disproportionate, that the head yeah. is too small to fit mm-hmm. the size of the body. And he suggests, and again, there's some evidence to to back it up, but he suggests that the pharaohs in their uh, you know, less civilized age of descending to Apara Yuga decided that they needed to make this a monument to themselves. And they had the head, which had been much bigger, carved down so it looked like a pharaoh, looked like a pharaoh's crown, essentially. Mm-hmm. But this man... Again, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Maybe he'll come to me here at some point. He suggested that that head was probably the head of a young woman. Because you can kind of see how the the, the pharaoh's crown would, you could chisel that out of a, a woman's hair. And that the face huh. is somewhat feminine looking. And what he suggested, with a big leap, but a leap I like, is that this was, this, the, the Great Sphinx is really a marker in time when Leo precessed into Virgo. And that okay. Virgo is the young woman and Leo is the lion body. And that that happened around 10,000 B.C., the last time that precession took place. So this could be an example. There's a lot of building one thing on another there that uh, I don't always allow myself to do, but it's so deliciously possible that I (laughs) I do like to share it. Uh, But another, you know, just more indication that there could have been that kind of knowledge in the past. So at a minimum, if it were true, it would suggest that the precession of the equinoxes was something that was understood in 10,000 BC, which is, uh, again, according to modern uh, history and the development of civilization, is not something that came along until uh, somewhere in our Kali Yuga period. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's always fascinated me that 24, 25,000 year cycle is definitely something that's mentioned in a lot of different places in a lot of different cultures. So there Mm -hmm. has to be some validity to it. Well, the precession itself is known as the, you know, the mechanism of it is understood today astronomically, but I think it was also measured in prehistory, deep into prehistory, even before things like the uh, Stonehenge came along that would all have allowed them to track it more uh, exactly. I think that and this is just my just my supposition, but that uh, they didn't need a mechanical means of tracking it before that time. But in the mm-hmm. you know descending Satya Yuga and descending Treta Yuga. They simply knew where they were in that process uh, intuitively. Yeah, that's that. That was fascinating. How literally, as you get to the very, very top, um, communication is telepathic, and you don't need to write things down because you know it. It it, it just flows, and then you get down to the uh, tretta and and. It, it is written down or it's symbolized someplace because it isn't remembered exactly so that they, they have like crib notes as to how to how to follow through with these procedures. And I it it, it fascinated me that you know, we assume that, that, that our brains expand as we get older and that the, the the different ages are going to increase with intelligence and expand with wisdom and, and all of that and then the thought the thought that we stop we start to lose stuff bothers me. 
Um, uh-huh. <laughs> well, one, one way I like to describe it is that, um, and this, this brings in a, another element to the story, a major element, but that is the notion of reincarnation. So just looking uh-huh. at reincarnation as a, as a concept, the way it's taught in uh, many esoteric ancient spiritual teachings is that we keep learning from incarnation yeah. to the next, and we grow and we learn and we grow and we learn. And that we, <clears throat> to some degree, keep what we've learned that we we do grow until we finally achieve a state of uh, high consciousness of self-realization. But we, as an individual, need to come into a birth, into a time that is going to have things to teach us. And the common way this is shared is to say that the the world we live in is a school. We are incarnated in it, and it's mm-hmm. going to teach us things, and then we're going to grow through them, and, and the next time we incarnate, we're going to be in a different part of the school and learn different lessons. So I think the yugas are just different grades in school, and that we are going to evolve ultimately graduate we're going to transcend and no longer even need to have earthly births because we will have graduated from the school but people coming up who are just coming into first grade so to speak they still need first grade the 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 world can't change so much or learn so much that there's no first grade anymore that uh, right. This is like no, but, Hogwarts, but that, you know. <laughs> yeah. But but as as you come in with you know, everybody doesn't come in at the Kali Yuga level. They could come in anywhere along the line in reincarnation. Right. If um, they, you know, if it was the right thing for them, we don't necessarily. As, my, as I understand the process of reincarnation, we don't necessarily have to learn everything there is to learn about first grade before we can go to second grade. We can spend a little time in second grade, maybe even third grade, and come back to first grade because um, we're talking about potentially thousands, tens of thousands of incarnations, and we're gonna we're gonna hop around a bit. But well, yeah, and you know, at, some, if we're, point, if we're at talking... some point, we need to know it. Well, you know, it, it's yes. As as we as we evolve, we we you know we come back for different lessons at different levels, certainly. But but you get to the top, and it's not top and out. It it's there have to be some that you know travel on back down. So is it is it important for There's the human no spirit to make? Well, <laughs> we're not bound okay. to the earth. No, We're not no, bound to no, the no, earth. No, of course not. But but so we just visit why, for a while. Yeah, we are a spirit on a human journey. I got that. But when you get to the top of this this yuga, um, then then consciousness starts to fade. I guess over over thousands of years, certainly. But but it but it for does, mankind as a whole. Know, but for an individual, that may be when you graduate. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, and then there's I a mean, new incoming is... freshman class. <laughs> okay, I'll go for that. I think that the, what what impressed me so much was that that with each of these levels, even though you know there were people that had um, that that had higher awareness and, and some lower awareness. It wasn't all just a, a one-size-fits-all. No matter what level you're on, there will there will be people who are above and below you as far as consciousness goes. And, and, and the determination of the yuga had to do with 
the the level of consciousness of the masses, not not those in power so much, but the masses were what determine where the level of consciousness is. Because in all of these levels, you're going to have people that are um, that appear to be superior or think they're superior, and you know take control over situations and and sometimes entire entire cultures, so that so that you know you go from a time of um, dictatorial stuff or or Caesars or stuff like that. I mean, but the the whole population, the population as a whole is not on the same level as as those random people that are above and below. Yeah, you're always going to have people in different levels of realization at any one time. But as you say, you're going to have this sort of center of gravity uh, that the majority of mankind is uh, at that same, more or less that same level of awareness. Um, And I think that's not... The the fact that you have all these people who are at the same general level of awareness is not determining the age. The age is determining the general level of awareness. So what Sri mm-hmm. Keshwar described, uh, and this is maybe a unique facet of lore that he passed on in this time, that isn't contained in the, you know, the Greek gold and silver, bronze and iron age, and all the others around the world, he actually passed on the mechanism that caused the cycle to happen, that caused the general level of awareness of mankind to either uh, expand or contract. And what he described is that the our solar system is receiving this power from somewhere in our galaxy or our universe. He wasn't specific about where, but he called it, he referred to it as the Grand Central Sun. And mm-hmm. that the closer we get to it, the more elevated mankind's consciousness becomes, and the farther we move away from it, the lower the consciousness of mankind becomes. And that he said this, getting closer to and further from, was a, uh, a intricately, in, intricately connected to the procession of the equinoxes. That that cycle, which modern astronomers say is something like 26,200 years uh, Mm -hmm. or 25,000, I'm forgetting exactly, but it's it's not 24,000 exactly like Sri Yukteswar has quoted the cycle as being, but that there is a movement, if you will. There is a... um, attunement happening on a vast scale all the way across the earth, all the way throughout our solar system, where we are bringing in or taking in more of this uh, elevating consciousness when we're on an upswing, or we're taking in less of that elevating consciousness when we're on the downswing. And that that cycle is what drives the 24,000 year cycle is it's this getting closer to or farther from this this uh, influence subtle energetic influence so for our time frame for those of us that are here now what it what is it we should expect well within our lifetime I don't think we're going to see massive change from around us. But what I think we get out of our lifetime is an opportunity. So I think every yuga has its challenge and its gift. Mm -hmm. So in Kali Yuga, 
the challenge is that it's a very brutish age. It's a very material age that the average person is aware only of what they can perceive through the senses. So mm -hmm. it's it's physical, it's sensory, and it sort of defines its goals. You know, if you, again, uh, going back to the Roman civilization, the kind of peak of power and uh, control that was exercised by the the Caesars and the noblemen around the Caesars was really to be able to command the most pleasure in life, physical pleasure. And there's, you know, we, we have the word orgy from those times, but they weren't mm -hmm. sort of bohemian odd things that happened that your mother didn't want you to ever know about, they were the pinnacle of you've arrived when you can have your own orgy. And you can eat for eight hours straight every delicacy known to man. The Romans were, were sensualists to the nth degree. And that is because the even they, as the pinnacle of that society, if you will, the, the Caesars and the noblemen, the wealthy, even as the pinnacle of it, they were still bound by this sensory awareness. So mm -hmm. the challenge in Kali Yuga, which was a steep challenge, was to try as a uh, soul growing through many, many incarnations towards greater and greater spiritual understanding was to see beyond the emphasis on materiality and to actually uh, try to feel and perceive things that were more subtle. If you could do it, the gift was if you could do it, it would do so powerfully. This was the age when you had uh, saints in Christian monasteries who led really ascetic, challenging lives where they just punished themselves in a way in order to rise above the flesh. Yeah. And if they managed to do it, the reward was great. But few managed to do it. So now in Dwapara Yuga, we have a different challenge and uh, a different gift. So in Dwapara Yuga, mankind as a whole, according to Sri Yukteswar, the keynote of it, mankind as a whole can appreciate that matter is an overlay of a more subtle reality, which is energy. So we often refer to Dwapara Yuga as the energy age. And it was during the transition from Kali Yuga to Dwapara Yuga, that fundamental scientific discoveries were made about how to uh, measure, harness, exploit energy, and put it to use in ways that were greater than anything that you know muscle power or animal power uh, or even wind power could have done or did do in, in Kali Yuga. And so we see the steam age as one of the first real uh, examples of Dwapara Yuga unfolding. And that mankind as a whole learned that you could concentrate power into these steam engines and that they could do the work of, of 10 times, 100 times the people and animals that used to do that work. And then steam was still pretty uh, material, if you will. 
But then more subtle layers of reality began to be perceived by scientists, and eventually they discovered electricity, electromagnetism, uh, and we got into the 1800s where the atom was uh, sort of theorized, and there was a greater understanding that there were there were two things working one with the other. One was matter and one was energy. Uh, and this was not even a dim concept in Kali Yuga. It was really not until this transition starting around 1700, 1800, that mankind as a whole began to make this distinction. And then in 1900... There, I haven't mentioned this before, but uh, according to Sri Yukteswar, each of our yugas that we've been talking about has a transition period of a, de- of a specific amount of time. So the transition mm-hmm. period from Kali Yuga into Dwapara Yuga is 200 years in length. And he would use the phrase, this is Sri Yukteswar, he would use the phrase that Dwapara Yuga proper, doesn't start until 1900, that from 1700 to 1900 we're in this transition where you're going from material awareness to more energy awareness. And is it at just about exactly 1900 that scientists like Einstein began to understand that there wasn't matter and energy, that matter was energy. And Mm -hmm. this is the heart of Einstein's special theory of relativity, which he published in 1906 with the famous equation E equals MC squared. So not only was he positing that matter was energy, he had an equation that described exactly how much energy was sort of condensed and congealed into matter. And this led to, as we know, many things, nuclear power, Of course, unfortunately, nuclear weapons. Uh, Uh. But throughout the 20th century, we began to exploit deeper laws of energy to make our civilization work. And that it made many, many things possible, like mass communication, like the Internet, like computers, uh, came out of this deeper and deeper awareness. So that's the challenge of Dwapara Yuga, is that we have all this power, and we could use it to destroy ourselves. We could use it to uh, amass greater and greater fortunes for individuals. We can use it... um, in ways that are basically self-interested, or we can choose it as a gift. And the gift, I believe, of Dwapara Yuga is that when somewhere in that transition time, more and more people tuned into the fact that we have inner energy, that, yes, in a physics sense, we ha- our bodies are made of energy, but this was something more subtle yet, that we have life force, and that mm-hmm. life force is what animates us. Life force is what flows through our body, uh, that when we're feeling uh, energetic and happy, we have a greater flow of life force when we're feeling uh you know, weak and and depressed, we have a low flow of life force. And that this ability to perceive life force is the the gift of Dwapara Yuga. I can't prove this, but I think it is probably true. Uh, You've probably done this trick, as I think almost everybody I know has Uh, done, if you rub your hands together really fast and kind of close your eyes and then stop rubbing them 
and, and just kind of pull them gently apart, maybe a half inch or an inch. And you'll start to feel as if there's something between your palms. Yeah. And there there's there's something there. And I believe that is one of the many ways in which we actually can experience our life force. Well, what I couldn't prove, possibly, but I believe to be true, is that if you put a bunch of people in Kali Yuga in a room and have them rub their hands together and pull their palms apart, that they would not feel it. They would not feel that life force. They would not feel that sense of energy, that it is coming into our awareness because our nervous systems are more refined in Dwapara Yuga than they were in Kali Yuga. And so innately, we are born with the possibility of tuning into life force. And that okay. is reflected in many ways in our current society. I mean, on the one hand, we have a society that's gone mad for uh, the use of energy and the perks of energy and the, uh, you know, the unfortunate uh, potentials for controlling the world through energy weapons and various things like that. We have that kind of occupying the majority of the world mind. And at the same time, there are millions and millions of people who are attracted to this inner experience because they can uh, they can feel it they can have an actual experience of their life force this underlies the fact that meditation has exploded in our world and is going uh, growing all over the world that yoga postures Tai Chi uh, subtle energy techniques like acupuncture or a, a modern, um, you know, the West version of acupuncture in a way, of chiropractic, that people are discovering the ability to be healed through energetic techniques rather than solely through medicines and yeah. um, surgery because they can, they can feel it. They can appreciate it. Now... I love the fact that if you look back in time and kind of line up our current just beginning to get into Dwapara Yuga with the 2,000 year ago, no, more than 2,000 years ago, um, 2,500 years ago, end of the last descending Dwapara Yuga and you look at their medicine and you look at their spiritual practices they included meditation they included yeah. subtle energy uh, that many of the things that are coming to the fore today as you know this wave of spiritual awakening are ancient practices They've been around for thousands of years. But they went out of vogue. They went out of mind, really, for the 2,400 years of Kali Yuga because the Kali Yuga consciousness just couldn't do anything with them. But now we can because we have this awareness of subtle energy. We have this awareness of life force. So I think that's the gift of our time. You know, you, the, my very long answer here started with your question about what, is this, what does this mean for us today? Well, I think what it means for us today is that we can make this choice as individuals of what part of Dwapara Yuga's capabilities we want to take advantage of. And if we choose to take advantage of the the inner energy awareness, then that can lead us to very subtle, very wonderful inner experiences. 
of of you know spiritual realization, connection to spirit, to love and joy and peace. That's the that's the doorway for us in this age, I think, to to attain those. In the next age, Treta Yuga, where the consciousness of mankind will already have sort of incorporated the knowledge of life force and moved into the knowledge of mind and thought and uh, being able to communicate telepathically, that'll have a different challenge and then a different gift uh, at another octave level, if you will, from where we are mm-hmm. now. But anyone born in those times will have that same challenge and and gift. I think the challenge in Trita Yuga is that people will be immensely powerful as individuals. Now people become powerful by kind of controlling a certain amount of the world around them, you know, whether it's lots of money or they're politicians or they're influential. They become powerful by by aggregating the things that are happening in this world. Where in Treta Yuga you can become powerful just by being um disciplined and focused enough to use your mind you can actually use your mind as a weapon or you can use it as a tool Uh Uh, a lot of the ancient tales of the the, you know the great heroes of the past like Rama and Krishna uh, there's the celestials in China and others I think they are actual stories that have been retold so many times that they've become distorted and they've been kind of modified by the understanding of increasingly less spiritual understanding and increasingly more material understanding for thousands of years. But they're basically talking about men and women who were immensely powerful and were demigods almost uh, would be the, the word that we use. So... That would be the challenge. Do you use your powers to go even deeper into spirit, or do you use them to to support a, a egoic desire to to have power over others? Well, it's just um, <clears throat> it, 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 in in my own opinion. It feels to me as though we do have those abilities now that they are dormant, but it it feels like they could be woken up if they if we knew how to do it. Yes, all of them could that's why I was saying that the life force awareness and learning to use your life force is the doorway, and it's the doorway to telepathy it's the doorway to um, uh-huh. these powers. It's the doorway to, to self-realization. That's our current doorway. In Kali Yuga, the doorway was, you know, self-punishment. It was, <laughs> it was it, yeah. extreme uh, discipline and um, asceticism. But now our doorway is a little more palatable, but it's still a doorway. It's not an end in itself. Just being able to feel and wield and use life force is is not all the way to our full potential as beings uh but yeah, I, I, in any yeah. in any period of time we can achieve all of those levels of consciousness yeah i've noticed that that <clears throat> especially in the metaphysical area there are people that have gotten attuned to that to a degree and, you know, call themselves psychics. And they're very happy to stay at that level, though. They don't I, – what I find fascinating is that once you reach that level, why don't you go for the next step? You know, because there's always another step. There's always another level. And yet people seem very satisfied to just sit in that one place and not grow anymore. 
Yeah, perhaps they yeah. just don't know or appreciate or haven't had some awakening experience that mm-hmm. makes them want to to achieve more or, or experience more. I don't know. I mean, every one of us is going to unfold uniquely, and uh, we don't always make oh, good yeah. choices. <laughs> so we don't always <laughs> understand very well. We make uh lots of mistakes we probably in the in the big picture of things often make two steps forward and one step back in our own in our own growth but i'm sure um i i i believe deeply that every one of us is unfolding exactly as we can and should oh absolutely no i i just um and, and, and I didn't mean it to even sound critical. It just seems to me that that it it's a stepping stone, you know, to go beyond that, to get more into the spiritual and understand the energies that are there and the gifts that are there and the talents that are there. And you know, it, it's it's kind of like if you don't if you stop learning, there's no point in being here. So. You know, and, and of course, we're learning on, on many different levels in many different areas, so that it's not just that one. But it, to me, it just feels like knowing there are all of these stages ahead of us for for the next oh, twenty thousand years or so. Um, right, or twenty million years, or <laughs> twenty yeah. billion years, yeah. Until we, and, uh, and it, you're going to put it. We keep growing. Until we attain endlessness. That's a good way of putting it. So, so we have this cycle um, we, we go through, and and of course, this this theory is is you know, um, in you know, uh, it's the it's the theory from this particular area on the world. I I think I think I loved the white buffalo. And how they explain the different ages. That is a great story. I'm glad you reminded me of it. So for for your listeners, there is the myth in India of the bull of Dharma. And as the story goes, the different ages of the yugas each adds a level of dharma, a level of righteous living to mankind. And so the the bull of dharma is said to uh, stand on all four legs in Satya Yuga. But it starts to lose some of that awareness and some of that righteousness. And when it enters Treta Yuga, it's said to stand on three legs. In Treta, and then in Dwapara, it loses even more of that, and it only stands on two legs until finally in Kali Yuga, it loses so much that it's only standing on one leg. That story is told in almost exactly the same terms by the Lakota Sioux, and they have White Buffalo Women tells this story of the White Buffalo that in the highest age stands on all four legs and in the lower ages stands on three and then two and then one. It's, you know, myth and lore are kind of built around images and so you can imagine that those images might be used in different cultures but to have it told so closely and to to make the same point is rather remarkable. And another another example of how the yugas are really just the Indian version of that universal truth. Yeah, and and it just it because it is so global, you have to you have to you have to think that 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 it 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 applies to every culture to one degree or another. And depending on how far back you go, you find the, the lore, and you find the the, um, the way they are perceiving the different the different levels of awareness that that we we go through over those periods of time. 
And isn't it isn't it? Um, I, it's another Native American Indian tribe that has the different times that we were, we are in cycles, and and I think right. we're in the four, what, is it fourth world or third world or whatever it is. Is that the um, not the Navajo, but the the other tribe that's in the southwest? I know who you mean. Yes, they have ages, and of course you have the Mayan calendar. People often ask mm-hmm. if the if the ages in the Mayan calendar are similar, um, and there there definitely are some parallels. I think that the Mayan calendar began just about at the exact same time that descending yuga, descending Dwapara yuga, excuse me, uh, began. And that um, it, while it doesn't exactly match up to the same time lengths for the different ages that the Yugas does, it has some similarities. So very few things. I mean, even the Yugas that I talk about, the lengths and the um, qualities of the Yugas, aren't expressed in India in the same way that I'm talking to you about them. I'm talking to you about them as they were uh, explained by Chikteswar. And he pointedly said, I'm I'm correcting mistakes here, that the way the yugas are understood in India uh, lost its way, and that the uh, current popular perception of the yugas in India uh, is that they are the, the world is still in Kali Yuga and will be in Kali Yuga for uh, many many thousands of years yet, and that we're you know we're in a very dark age and they don't recognize at all what your Teshwar explained to be the truth that we had moved into Dwapara Yuga uh, almost 300 years ago now. So all of these myths kind of need a uh, a refresher. <laughs> they need somebody <laughs> like Sri Keshwar to, to come along and um, reinterpret them so that uh, some of the exactitude that they did have in the past is restored. And I think that's why they all, um, they're, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Mark Twain. He said, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. <laughs> so I think all these I like cycles, it. they kind of rhyme. They don't, you know, exactly mesh, but they rhyme. Uh, if for no other reason than that they all look backwards in time and say there was a higher age, you know, eons ago, what, however they describe what an eon is, uh, and they all do that. You know, none of them are saying, okay, we're in the second age, and we've got, you know, two more descending ages to go. They all pretty much say now we're in the dark age because they were uh, solidified, if you will, in Kali Yuga, which was the dark age, which was the lowest age. So the the rhyming gets pretty good, but it's it's still rhyming. <laughs> well, I loved what you did in the book when you when you went back and you you applied the dates to the different yugas and what went on during those time frames so that you made it very obvious and clear, you know, what was going on in that time frame for the masses and how the consciousness of that time was so accurate to the age that it was in. So that you know you moved this backwards through time to sort of explain how how they fit, and you know for twenty five thousand twenty four thousand years that, that's a long time to to be in a particular age, and then depending on how many hundreds of years or thousands of years, the transition time as well when it was sort of an overlap, so to speak, so that mm-hmm. so that you know you you, you put you put history and and you know what we know of history into the different ages and and showed how the level of consciousness for that particular age 
was very appropriate to the consciousness of the masses at that particular time. So you have a wonderful, um, wonderful examples. Um, I mean, when you go back in time, you go way back. But um, the ones that, that are, you know, close to to human history type stuff that that we can kind of relate to were so accurate, it was quite unbelievable. Well, thank you. I'm so, glad that you you had that experience. I, I think, as you were saying, the these transition times between one age, one yuga, and the next can actually be the most revealing about both of them. So uh, mm-hmm. I began almost from the beginning talking about the Great Pyramid, but uh, I only took the discussion as far as to say it was extraordinarily well-built structure, just completely out of any kind of seeming sequence of development. So you had, again, according to the sort of mainstream view of archaeology, the people living in the area around Egypt 200, 300, 500 years before the pyramids were built were considered to still be in the Stone Age Mm -hmm. and that they were, you know, largely hunter-gatherers. They they had, you know, just the vestiges of uh, domesticating animals and pottery and the things that, you know, our beloved of, of archaeologists were just starting, and yet, as if you know, out of nowhere, all these primitive Stone Age people said, "Hey, let's build pyramids." <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's build this. You know, the Great Pyramid until 1600 A.D. was the tallest building on Earth. For almost 5,000 years. And so you have to sort of ask, well, what would have possessed these people? And if if they were just coming together in kind of city-state groups, they had to be asking themselves, what is worth our time, right? Do we really want to devote every possible moment of excess manpower for 20 years to build this one pyramid, and they built a whole bunch more at the same time around that same period. Um, you know, you you have to think they're either massively superstitious or stupid to get <laughs> kind of duped into this. Let's do this. Let's build this amazing structure. But if you look at it not in this linear way of cavemen to Um, hunter-gatherers to building the pyramids, but instead look at it as in this descent that they were coming from a higher age before the Great Pyramid. The Treta Yuga was a time when mental telepathy was commonplace, where mental powers were commonplace. And as they entered Dwapara Yuga, yes, they were losing abilities, But those abilities were within sort of generational memory. And what I believe they were doing was they were trying to preserve as much of Treta Yuga capability as they could. And that Mm -hmm. the Great Pyramid was a multiplier of spiritual growth that it was designed to be a massively significant boost for people who were meditating and trying to achieve higher consciousness, but needed this extra energy to really uh, grow. One of the traditions of the more esoteric view of the Great Pyramids is that the pharaohs came from this process of 
you know, essentially growing spiritual adepts through a, a, a more mechanical-ish way than they did in Treta Yuga, where it was less effortless. Mm-hmm. And that they they wanted to preserve a tradition of wise leaders, so they created this whole system of initiates and meditators and gradually getting stronger and stronger in their own uh, mental, emotional, physical abilities until they were ready to get this huge boost by going into the higher chambers in the Great Pyramid. Uh, Elizabeth Height, who is a psychic, wrote this marvelous book called uh, Initiation, and she talks about lifetimes that she spent, one of which uh, was as a pharaoh's daughter, and it was her whole experience of being in this uh, process of of being uh, trained spiritually in a very, very methodical, orderly way, culminating in in um, this huge step up that you experienced when you were ready for it, uh, of going into the Great Pyramid. So this can explain, you know, for skeptics, everything I'm saying is just crazy, but it can <laughs> logically explain why so much time and care was put into this enormous uh structure, also why it was um, clad in the limestone, which is said to be an insulator for these subtle energies that are being focused inside the Great Pyramid, Uh, Mm -hmm. but that it had a very high and very real purpose based on this crossover from Treta into Dwapara. We're trying to hang on to Treta's abilities by using the the highest tools they could that were Dwapara tools. They were trying to uh, take that life force awareness natural to Dwapara uh, Yuga and, and take it back up a notch into Treta Yuga consciousness. And I think that happened for for quite a while. It's interesting um, from an archaeological standpoint that the Egyptians kept making pyramids for quite a while, um, long after the three or four, you know, the Bent Pyramid, the Step Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, etc. After that period, they kept making them, but they made them less and less and less well until the, the the ones most recent to us have basically become big mounds of sand in the desert because they were built so poorly. Yeah. Where the ones that were the farthest time ago uh, are still standing. So that also speaks to the um, this declining ability and awareness of the time. So that that cusp between Treta Yuga and Dwapara Yuga it is fascinating. And there are well, there's and other evidence that there they had um other technologies that they used that aren't even hinted at in modern archaeology that they knew how to use high speed drills, for example, in order to build some of those uh, constructions that they used giant wheels that they turned either with animal power or people power and focused it onto a very small wheel which would spin really fast. There are pictures. Um, Chris Dunn has a uh, great book about the technology of that period of time. And he's a machinist. He's an engineer and a machinist. And so when he went and wandered around the pyramids of Giza, he would see all these kind of piles of odd stuff around the pyramid. And he'd say, oh, well, that's where <laughs> that's where they built that. <laughs> that's where they had the ability to, to develop a high-speed drill. And then you can see there are just 
huge rocks, huge stones with perfect holes drilled through them, drills, holes that are two and three inches in diameter that are perfectly smooth all the way through the rock. Now, how do you do that with a copper chisel? Think about it yeah. for a moment. There's no way. You can't do it yeah. by melting it. You can't do it by, you know, applying successive coats of, of acid to it. Uh, and you can actually see, when you get it in the right light, you can actually see the circular marks left by a drill going through that rock. So not only did they have an intention to build the Great Pyramid in order to retain higher consciousness, they had higher awareness of engineering and building principles than the Egyptians had 2,000 years later. Yeah. You, you, you also mentioned that with every level, especially at the transition times, there were people that, that came into the lifetime that had the higher skills and that had lower skills, too. So it wasn't, it wasn't just segmented you know, to one type of people, there there was there were hangovers and layovers, so that that I think in some ways um, became wise people that helped people to understand things better. Mm-hmm. And I think they had much more of a reverence for the past in those ages, so they they wanted traditions to keep living. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know how much longer the uh, tradition of uh, reciting Sanskrit slokas in order to maintain the integrity of Sanskrit. I don't know how much longer that will last in our modern age, where we don't um, we don't appreciate the value of the past because we think everything is going to get better in the future, which it will. <laughs> but uh, you know, we don't necessarily think that that is going to improve in the future by us understanding the past, where in the descending Dwapara Yuga, descending Treta Yuga, uh, they appreciated that they were losing it, and so they wanted to do things that would allow them to hang on to it as long as possible. Yeah, I you know, you, you sometimes I, I sometimes wondered, you know, when 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 there was this kind of downward slope, so to speak, people realizing that the the the, the, the people the new people being born just didn't have the interest or the desire or the ability to stretch the way previous generations did, and that must have been an incredible awareness to be difficult to grasp. Um, you know, descending is probably not as much fun as ascending. Yes, but again, the it, it change is slow, and um, I think that it, with all things, there's a challenge and a gift. So mm-hmm. I'm sure there is a particular gift that... Um, came to people who were born in those ages who, you know, by looking to the past, by respecting the traditions that came before them, this was their chance to to grow in, in mm-hmm. deeper and more spiritual ways, where others who uh, embraced... You know, they might have seen, let's think of entering Dwapara Yuga, the lion's share of people alive in Dwapara Yuga may have seen cities as a great step forward where those who had retained the teachings of Dwapara Yuga would understand that this is a um, a level down in relying on something less true, less deep, and yeah. that it was leading to things like personal wealth and control of other people and many of the ills um, that we still have today 
But the people at the time might have thought, hey, this is great. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, let's yeah, build, let's build look, a city. We look at the Great Pyramid today knowing it came from a time that there was an advanced civilization sometime in the past that created it. And we can't replicate it. I mean, people have tried, and they haven't been able to. So that in knowing that there was a culture, you know, at some point in time in our past that, that surpassed us uh, in many ways to what we do today um, is is fascinating. And... You know, it it couldn't have come from a Kali Yoga group, so it it had to come from either the Tetra or the um, the top one. So yeah. that you know, you kind of, gosh, you wonder. There's got to be a way to try to stretch consciousness into that time frame to to sort of pull back some of the talents and gifts and apply them to this lifetime. Well, we are discovering them, you know, as we already discussed. I mean, so many of the things that have come forward in the last hundred years that I would think of now as the kind of spiritual but not religious movement, Uh many of them came to us from descending Dwapara Yuga or even Treta Yuga teachings. So they are... They are coming back to us. Um, most people aren't very conscious of that. But if you look at the history of um, early spiritual movements in America and around the world, you'll see a lot of Indian teachings, which are Vedic teachings, and Vedic teachings all come to us from Treta Yuga. Ayurveda, yeah. Ayurveda is one of the teachings of the Vedas, so it's uh, it's there, it is influencing us, and we're only now awakening to it because our consciousness is on par with the consciousness that was the, the norm that many thousands of years ago. So how much longer do we have before we go through a transition period. Well, we're early in Dwapara Yuga, so um, Dwapara Yuga in its entirety is 2,400 years. So we're only 300 years and change into this particular ascending Dwapara Yuga. So we got a long way to go. Uh, yeah, but 2100. What yeah, I think we'll see if we could. If we could dial the knob on our time machine forward, is that the uh, people who are now in the minority, who are the spiritual but not religious uh, group, will grow and grow and grow and grow until everybody is in the spiritual but not religious group. And that is to say Mm -hmm. uh, that commandment-driven Thou shalt religions will eventually give way to people having direct experience, which is really what meditation is all about. That's why meditation is so central to spiritual teachings today is that you don't have to believe it. You can experience it. And then when you experience it, you know it. And um, it's also less about what particular way you made it to that discovery, whether it's through Christianity or through Hinduism or through Buddhism, as it is the actual experience that unites religions rather than divides them. So I think over the next hundreds of years, this uh, balance is going to shift. And then I think the other balance that's going to shift is that we have a very... Um, still pleasure-driven, power-driven, cultural um, bias. 
that makes people very self-interested in, but in a selfish way that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want to have the best experiences sensually. They want to have their best possessions and they want to, you know, in order to get those things, they want to control the world around them where those who are finding that satisfaction in life inwardly realize that you don't have to have possessions, that you don't have to have sensual experiences, that you don't have to control the world around you to be happy. Uh, But it's going to take a long time before that evolution takes place in the broader culture that is our Dwapara Yuga culture. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I just noticed the time. Um, I, I, would you give your contact information and your website so people can, can go find you and your books, which now I've done all three of them. I'm so proud of me. Uh, well, I'm very happy that you did, too. These uh, interviews have been a pleasure. So um, the easiest thing to remember, I think, is Joseph selby.com the spelling of my name uh, last name is somewhat unusual it's S-E-L-B-I-E rather than the more typical S-E-L-B-Y spelling of Selby mm-hmm. so Joseph Selby with the I-E end at the uh, last part of the last name uh, josephselby.com you can go there, you can find all my books you can find articles you can find um some class series that I have on the yugas as well as on other subjects. And then all of the books, uh, The Physics of God, Break Through the Limits of the Brain, the yugas, they're available on most e-tailing sites. They're available as Kindle. They're available as Audible books if you like to listen to your books rather than read them. Um, So just let your let your fingers do the walking through Google, and you can find find those books in a lot of places. And they're all fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful um, evening. I, I just uh, I could listen to you talk all night, but I don't think Blog Talk's going to let us sit here all night. So, <laughs> matter of fact, they're about to shut us down. So. Thank you very much. I so appreciate your your sharing your time with us. Been my pleasure. Oh, mine too. Have a great evening now. You too. Okay, every okay everybody. Thanks for being here. Check us out on YouTube, uh, BarbaraDelong dot com. No, no, Barbara DeLong. And um, subscribe to the show, and keep us in your thoughts and. We're going to be back with lots of fascinating stuff coming up. So uh, have a great evening. Have a great week, day, whatever. And wherever you are, uh, check this out because it, it does help one to understand, to advance, to have a better understanding of where we are in time and space, and to sort of point you in another direction. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to read. Good night now.